is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, it's The Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. Christina Ellis, Ramsey personality, newest Ramsey personality, is joining me for a segment here. We want to make sure you, you guys all get to know her, and uh, you'll be hearing a lot more from her in the coming weeks and coming years, and uh, we look forward to that. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So Christina has quite a storied background before she joined our team. She had a best-selling book called Confessions of a Scholarship Winner and how-to books and how to graduate debt-free. She started a website called collegeninja.com that we are melding into the Ramsey stuff as well. And she is a college ninja, without a doubt. She uh, secured over $500,000 in scholarships, went to Vanderbilt and got her degree and got a master's degree as well. And all of it's supported by scholarships. So she's walking, living proof that you can go to school debt-free and that it's possible, right? Yes, Absolutely. Yes. If you are willing to fight for it and put together a strategy, there is no reason that you need debt for college. You can do it. So lest someone think that this is a uh, uh, privileged situation that sets you up for this, none of these scholarships were athletic. None of them were academic. Mm -mm. Um, Your dad passed away of cancer when you were seven. And so you're being raised by a single mom, and she sat down with you and had a conversation. Yes. The first day of my freshman year of high school, my mom sat me down. And she said, Christina, I love you and I believe in you, but there's just no way that I can support you financially once you graduate from high school. So you got to figure out your own way to pay for college. And at first I was shocked. I thought, why are you telling me this? I am a freshman in high school. What can I do about it? But at the same time, I knew that she was just trying to help and cast a vision for me. Yeah, and she's she's your mom. I love your mom. I mean, she's just old school. She's v- oh. Venezuelan, is that what it was? Yes. Yeah, she's from, from Venezuela. Came here, married an American, and your dad, and he passed away. And so she's like scratching and clawing, immigrant m- mentality, get her done, baby. Oh, you know, yeah. kind of woman. And this is this woman's a force of nature. She's uh, anything but a victim, and wasn't going to allow you to be. Oh, yeah. She's such a fighter. And the thing is that she immigrated from Venezuela in her 20s. She actually got a scholarship to come here to the United States. And she grew up in a pretty rough background, kind of the slums of Venezuela. So she, in her perspective, was like, I got you this far. So now what are you going to do? Like, here's the baton. You better run hard and fast to get to the next level. Yeah, you already got a whole bunch more than I got. So right. no whining. And here's what we're going to do. But she didn't just dump it on you as a as a ninth grader and leave you uh uh, penniless or, or or hopeless, she actually was your cheerleader and really gave you a system. She was an incredible cheerleader, and I actually love that she told me in ninth grade. I think that all parents need to have those conversations as early as possible because she let me know the reality of what I was going to face, and she gave me time to come up with a strategy. You know, I read every book, every resource. I um, interviewed alumni from my high school to figure out, you know, what does it take to win scholarships, and how can I stand out in the process? You know, she encouraged me to put together a plan and strategy, and then I implemented it all throughout high school. I just continually what did, did you that. do? I got involved in extracurricular activities. I worked on building up my grades. I took the right classes. I took up leadership roles. I volunteered. You know, I wasn't a star athlete. You know, I didn't have perfect grades. So I had to figure out, you know, how can I stand out in the process? And something that I did is I volunteered a ton. I did over a thousand hours of community service when I was in high school. And I continued to create opportunities and just look for ways that were unique to stand out. Also doing things that I love. I encourage people, you know, when you're trying to get involved in high school and stand out in the process, don't just do things because they stand out in the scholarship application process. Do things that you love. When you're doing things that you love, you're going to want to pour into them and then naturally stand out. And then you filled out scholarship applications and essays like daily. Yes. My mom and I kind of lived in the library. And that's another cool thing about my mom is like she didn't just tell me what to do. You know, she would sit with me at night and we would talk about applications. We would do the research together on the computer and we would just she would be my cheerleader when I was applying. You know, I would get bored sometimes and be like, oh, do I have to do these applications? Come on. And she would, you know, help me take a break and be like, you know, let's go grab some coffee. Let's just like make this a fun process and let's do this. You know, she helped me stay pumped up. 
Yeah. And so how many scholarships do you think you applied for? I applied for around 50 scholarships, which actually now that I do this for a living and I talk to people about scholarships, I encourage people to apply for a lot more. You know, I was very fortunate that I won some very big scholarships, but I love to see students applying for 100 or 200 scholarships because the more you put yourself out there, the greater chance you have of winning. Yeah. And and 100 at $250 gets a lot of money. Yes. It adds up. It adds up incredibly fast. Yeah. And you can go through school debt free. Now, we've got the book here, Debt Free Degree by Anthony O'Neill, that uh, we teach people how to go to school debt free. College choice is a big part of it. Uh, But if you get $500,000 worth, you don't even have to worry about college choice, right? Yeah, I was very fortunate. I was able to go to Vanderbilt University for my undergrad and Belmont for grad school, completely debt free. And they're not cheap schools. Both of them are expensive. Yes. Both of them are really expensive. Yeah. So, but if you if you don't get five hundred thousand dollars worth, you have to, you need to choose a school that is within the budget of the money you can get your hands on, whether it's scholarship money or working or wherever you're going to get the money. You choose a school that's within that budget, and that is the number one thing that drives people into college debt. Yes, I always want people to explore their options. That's the thing is that there are so many choices out there. I feel like a lot of students get stuck on this idea of a specific school that costs 50 or $70,000 and you don't have to go that direction. There are so many different options for a debt-free degree. You know, there are tons of free community colleges nowadays. There are a lot of employers that are offering incredible tuition benefits. A lot of employers are now offering free college if you work for them, plus you can still earn money while you're employed. So it's It's really cool to see all of these options growing and expanding. The first time I ever saw that, UPS was doing it in Louisville, in their home office. And you could load trucks, and they'd pay for you to go to school at the University of Louisville. And, um, you know, that was an incredible benefit. Now a ton of people are doing that. With the current upside-down world we've got on labor and labor shortage, and it's $15 an hour to work at Target, and they'll pay for your college. And so, you know, probably 10 or 15 other major employers are offering that benefit. And so if you want to go to school debt-free, you need to be willing to work. You need to be willing to set aside time and apply for scholarships. You need to be very careful about your college choice. Oh, and did I mention you need to work? Yes. And that's what's so cool is that you can literally work and make an income while getting a free degree. So it's like you avoid student loans completely and you're making money, which it's like that's kind of the best of both worlds. You can follow Christina at I am Christina Ellis on Twitter and on Instagram. Uh, you'll learn more about scholarships and more about Ramsey Money Principles. And as she has joined the uh, money section of the Ramsey Personality Team, and certainly with a specialization in this, but you'll hear her talking about all the other things as she joins this show in the coming weeks and months and joins our lineup and our, our events and things. You'll see her everywhere. Welcome to the team, Christina. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Gonna be a, Gonna be a great great ride. This lady's a smart lady. She's uh, way smarter than me. You put her and John Deloney in the same room, my IQ goes up just walking in there. So there you go. This is The Ramsey Show. If you're looking for ways to update your home without blowing the budget, I've got it. For years, I've been telling you about our friends at Blinds.com. Blinds.com makes it simple to shop top quality blinds, shades, and interior shutters from home with easy online ordering and free shipping. With Blinds.com, there's no need to renovate your entire home. Just change out what's on your windows with upscale choices like faux wood blinds, cellular, and roller shades or even outdoor shades. Plus, Blinds.com guarantees the perfect fit. Whether you do it yourself or you have them measure and install everything for you. Shop their latest looks and see how much you can save at Blinds.com today. The easy and affordable way to make your home more beautiful is Blinds.com.
Dr. John Deloney, Ramsey Personality, joins me this hour. Open phones at 888-825-5225. He's my co-host. He's also the host of the Dr. John Deloney podcast, uh, one of our fastest growing properties on Ramsey Networks right now. Uh, everyone tuned in and listening about relationships. This is the show where we talk about relationships. We talk about your work. We talk about your money. We talk about you. And if you want to get in, the phone number again, 888 825 True or false, it's possible for you to become a millionaire. What if I told you the answer is... It's possible, and it's up to you. Research shows you don't need a six-figure income, you don't need an inheritance, and you don't need to win the lottery to become a millionaire. People just like you, research says, real data, not opinions, reach millionaire status simply by following our baby steps. We call them Baby Steps Millionaires. The Baby Steps Millionaire's book that came out last week, number one bestseller, shows you exactly how to do that. And with our best year ever bundle you get a copy of the brand new baby steps millionaires book and you also get signed up for financial peace university and the premium version of every dollar in ramsey plus when you use these tools and you follow these simple steps you will build wealth you will build your bank account you will eventually become a millionaire the typical person is 12 to 17 years so learn about the best year ever bundle by visiting RamseySolutions.com slash best. That's RamseySolutions.com slash best. Our phone number here to talk is 888-825-5225. That's 888-825-5225. Our question of the day comes from Blinds.com. Find out for yourself why Blinds.com is the number one online retailer of custom window coverings with free samples, free shipping, and new promos all the time. Use the promo code RAMSEY to get the best deal. Today's question comes from Hannah in Illinois. She says, I've always struggled with emotional spending to fill a void in my life and stress situations. When my husband and I started dating, he was debt free, which prompted me to want to get out of debt. I was able to pay off four grand before we got married. And then my husband paid off the rest of my $5,000 debt. We were debt free for 10 months until the pandemic hit and the stress spiraled into spending on my credit cards. I thought I would be able to pay them off, but I kept spending and the shame of the debt overwhelmed me. So I kept it a secret. My husband was angry when he finally had a discussion about my debt and I closed my accounts. How do I how do I handle the shame of past mistakes and avoid emotional spending? I want to do better in our finances and work together, but my husband doesn't believe I am willing to change. Man, Dave, there's a lot here. Um, first, I, I don't know that her husband's uh, angry about the spending as much as the dishonesty and the deceit and the, as we call it around here, financial infidelity here. I'm sure he was upset about the spending, but more of the violation of trust. Um, so the way I've heard guilt and shame framed is guilt is when you say I've done something that violates my moral boundaries. Shame is when you say I am like not, not I cheated. I should feel guilty about cheating on a test. I'm a cheater. I carry that shame around with me. And so when anyone says, how do I get rid of my shame? I think you pull your, I say, I'm going to pull myself away from these set of behaviors and I'm going to say, I'm going to stop doing these things. Your husband uh, doesn't believe you're willing to change because I don't see here that I'm that you're willing to change. I see, I hear Dave in this language, this over and over. Um, I'm just out of control with this thing. It controls me, and nothing I can do about it. And I, just, I don't have a choice in this. I, it owns me. I, I stone cold disagree with that. Yeah, I, if you label yourself, which is shaming, you're right. If you, I, I'm a, I'm an emotional spender. Then you're no longer. Uh, uh, held accountable for the fact that you're just not being an adult. That's right. Like I'm six two. I have to bend over to get into a a, a, a four foot, you know, f- fence. Let's say. Mm-hmm. Like, that's a that's a fact. I'm six foot two. She is not an emotional spender. Six foot two, right? Mm-hmm. She no, has she... labeled herself an emotional spender, right. and right. that's how she has chosen to cope with things in the past. Well, and, and it lets you off the hook for for the uh, pain of the responsibility to change. That's right. If you label yourself, well, I've got this disease. I've got a problem. and I've got this disease, and so I'm stuck. Can't help it. I'm just the way I am. So, Hannah, you know what you do? You get rid of all of your cards. You get rid of all of your internet access. I mean, how far do you want to go to keep your marriage? How far do you want to go to stop this kind of behavior? Mm -hmm. Do you want to get to the – spend some time with a counselor and get to the root of 
what, why you feel the need to do this. I mean, you could go to the ends of the earth to fix yeah. some of this behavior. You do some emotional spending and you've had some immaturity and some weakness that has led you to that. You are not defined as an emotional spender. And, and the that's way what you've got that, to change. The way you just said that is so empowering. I don't know how the culture got sideways in this. Yeah. But to well, pat because, people because on the head. we want to be victims instead of victors. But you know, do you realize how like what you just said is so much more empowering than oh, honey, you've you've got an emotional spending problem disorder. It's not even a disorder, but yeah, um, well, that's what she wants to say. Versus, so. you made some bad choices. I, I, I stand have, up on. I struggled with emotional spending to fill an emotional void. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've struggled with uh, chocolate chip cookies to fill an emotional void too, oh. but I'm not one. Yeah. <laughs> My tendency is to, I have the same one. My tendency is to emotional eat. So I've got to set up some. You're not a gummy bear. Oh, God <laughs> almighty. I can get after some gummy candy. But, so here's the thing. I have to set up a lot of boundaries in my life. Ask people, I ask people in this building to hold me accountable to that. Well, right? he, yeah, he, here's the thing. When you go through something like that, that is not an a, a fact. Instead, it's a perception. Right. Then what you have to do is you have to change your mindset about it. And so, um. I, I think there's a whole lot of hope for her, and what her husband is afraid of, and it's coming out as anger, is that she's going to stay in this hole because she believes she is this hole. And she hasn't and, gotten to the root of, yeah. I lied to my husband. Yeah, yeah. I, well, and, and and on top of that, um, you know, I just straight up, as an adult who, who legally can do stupid things, did some stupid things. Right. Call it out. Yeah, just say, I did. You know, I, I, when I went bankrupt, you know why I went bankrupt? Because I borrowed too stinking much money, you know, and because I was an idiot. I got a Ph.D. in D.U.M.B. and I signed up for a bunch of short term notes. And the stupid bankers took my head off. Well, I put my head on the block. That's how they took it off. You don't stick your head on the block. You don't even get it taken off. Right. So um, American Express calls my house now. It's a wrong number. I mean, we don't deal with these people anymore because I'm not going to ever be back. So you have to have a moment in time where you say I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Never again. Right. Never again. That is not who I am. I don't act this way. And you start, and it's not some kind of false new age affirmation or something, but you never again label yourself as an emotional spender. You label yourself as someone who used to spend emotionally. Mm -hmm. I've, I've done that a couple times in my past. I don't do that anymore. No, James Clear would say label it the opposite. I'm somebody who is a steward of my finances. Yeah. And I'm going to live really that. good with money now. That's right. And I'm really good at staying out of debt and building wealth. So what are the practices I'm going to put in my and life? I'm a guy that went bankrupt. That's right. And there, Dave, there are times when I will not go into a gas station because you know what's in gas stations? Gummy bears. Oh my gosh, gummy <laughs> candies. If I'm, I haven't slept, if I'm tired, if I'm in a bad mood, I won't go in because I know that when I go in you there, you can't go in a bar if you're a drunk. That's right. That's right. Go sit down at the bar where everybody else is ordering a double. If you're a drunk and go, well, you know, I used to drink a lot, but now I'm in, put myself in a situation here where I'm going to drink again. Don't put yourself in a situation. You can't do that if you've no. got a history of that and you've got a history of this. And I had a history of misbehavior with money, yeah. but it, and it was uh, somewhat greed driven, somewhat emotional maturity driven, somewhat identity driven. There's a lot of things that drove it, but all of those things are things I chose. Right. And That's I right. can just decide to unchoose them. Right. And go, but and we had a good call the other day. You and I did about a lady said, "How do I break my poverty mentality?" Mm. And it's it's the same thing. Only I think we're probably a little bit more sympathetic for that. Yeah. Than I am with this one. Uh, yeah, because you grew up with a model. And yeah, she grew up with a thing, and she never seen anything model. else. Yeah. And, and and she hasn't labeled herself with that. She said, "How do I not be that?" That's right. Yeah. And that's a much better question than than. Uh, you know, how do I work? How do I do better in our finances? Uh, right. You don't. You decide you're better. Yeah. And then you work on your finances with your husband. And you may need to, for a period of time, uh, you need to get out all the credit cards and chop them up. And you may need to have a real clear weekly discussion with your husband about where all the money in the house Carry is. cash with you. So that he rebuilds trust over time because you lied to him. That's right. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, everybody makes mistakes like you made, Hannah. We're not shaming you for doing that. But for God's sakes, don't label yourself. I'm trying to unshame you. I'm trying to give you your power. I'll tell you, one, I, another one I get all the time is, I'm not good with math. Yeah. So I can't do money. Right. Well, by God, people can do all kinds of sixth grade math. <laughs> and sixth grade math is what it takes to be good with money. This is The Ramsey Show.
chaos. That's what it can feel like when your business is growing so fast you've outgrown your financial and accounting software. The faster you grow, the more likely you are to lose control of the numbers. And here's the reality. If you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. That's why we use NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. Over 28,000 companies use NetSuite by Oracle, including Ramsey Solutions, because NetSuite gives us a single view of everything we need to make daily decisions. Whether you're making a few million to hundreds of millions, a year, NetSuite gives you the visibility and control of the things you need to grow, like your financials, inventory, HR, planning, budgeting, and more, all in one dashboard. Go to netsuite.com slash Ramsey right now to get their free white paper, Jumpstart Your CFO Career. Dr. John Deloney, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. On the stage, the debt-free stage, in the lobby of Ramsey Solutions, Evan joins us. Hi, Evan. How are you? Good. How are you? Better than I deserve. Where do you live? Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. All right. Cool. And how much debt have you paid off, sir? 168000 Whoa! How long did that take? <laughs> 21 months. Oh, this is rocking. <laughs> and uh, your range of your income during that time? From 65 to 292. Now, this is bizarre. Okay, so what in the world do you do for a living, and what happened to this income? So I am a executive recruiter for a large third-party recruiting firm. And you've had a good year. You had a good year, man. <laughs> had a pretty good year. <laughs> Holy <laughs> crap! Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the great resignation has worked in your favor. A little bit, yeah. So yeah, I think. Wow! The, uh, the shift actually happened a little bit before that. So I was working in Midland, where I believe John knows a little too yeah. well, in yeah. the oil field, yeah. And so I switched into the recruitment, and 2020 was weird for recruiting to say the least and then in 21 it got a lot better all of a sudden wow. yeah all yeah pretty much sudden. out of nowhere so, so you went from the oil field some of the hardest work on the planet to being a recruiter and you go from 65,000 to 300,000 yep dad come dude <laughs> yeah mic drop mic and it's in the air conditioning too touchdown dance yeah. i like it yeah, man i work from a home office not in the middle of a frack site <laughs> oh wow whoa that's awesome life is this is amazing so, so why the change why the change well money <laughs> well, well, you can make you can make good money in the oil field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can so, make three hundred on the no, oil field. No, not three hundred, but right. depends. You can so, do it right. Yeah. So I actually have an engineering background, and the work I was doing was not engineering driven at all. Okay. And so, the shift came both to get from Midland back to Pittsburgh, and then also because you don't have to be in the middle of a heavy industrial setting with gotcha. your fingers on the line. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard work too. Yeah. And, and on top of that, I mean, physical labor. And uh, not that recruiting from your home office isn't hard work, but there's a difference between getting a callus on your dialing finger. But um, so uh, 168,000, what kind of debt? So it was a uh, bulk student loans. There was a nice car in there. There is a little bit of credit card debt, and then the KGB. Oh, we got behind with the IRS. How much did you owe the IRS? It wound up being like $2,800. Oh, okay. And so this was dumb college kid. I mm -hmm. worked a similar oil and gas thing between semesters 1099 did not just, know that not, i was yeah. 1099 found out three and a half years after the fact in the middle of going through this and so wow. that was a that was a murphy's law situation yeah. and did you buy your fancy car when you got in the field too i bought my fancy car about six months before i left yep few <laughs> few think, groups yeah. of people <laughs> overspend on cars like roughnecks yeah no it's uh it's lived the stereotype for wow. sure what did you buy Toyota 4Runner. Okay. All right. What did you owe on it? Uh, it was like 31-ish. Yeah. Okay. That's not too bad. I was expecting no. 50. Okay. Well, that's and, what they are so, brand new. <laughs> yeah. And so the, uh, but the student loans were over 100 and something. Yeah. It was like, so the pre, the day-ish year mm -hmm. I had before that 21-month period, student loans were like 170 or 180. Mm -hmm. That In that 21-month timeline, it was actually only about 115 of it. Okay. All right. Wow. And uh, boom, knocked it out. 
Man, so what happened? You get to Pittsburgh, you obviously start making great money. You got a great shovel to get out of this big hole yep. you're in, and a whole paradigm shift. How'd you get connected with us? How'd you start this whole process? <laughs> yeah, so a buddy of mine from college, uh, he was telling me about the podcast and stuff like that. Him and his wife had done like 60 or 70 grand in less than a year. And he, I was hoping I was going to be able to find the conversation for the pictures. And the it, the quote that I would give from him, he was like, there's this guy in Tennessee. He's a redneck money guru. And, <laughs> I like and him. Like, yeah, I do too. Accurate, and, accurate description. A <laughs> little and, bit on the nose, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah. And he goes, he goes, you should check out this podcast because you've been talking about the, the student loans forever and ever. And I know you've been hitting them hard and this might help really light an extra fire and you know the the money didn't come immediately with the recruiting you know it took about 12 or 13 months of that 21 to really build up to consistent commission checks and stuff like that that helped pay for all of it but his intro to the podcast it was three hours a day every day listening to the podcast constantly yeah Wow, I need to change my moniker to Redneck Millionaire. Dude, I think that's. I, think that's, I don't like the guru thing, so just Redneck Millionaire, and that's better than Dave Ramsey himself, which people always come in by him. You would have sold a lot I'm more now books. Called, I'm now called himself. If it was, if it mean? was a Redneck Millionaire, yeah. as if I would be someone else. How yeah. how hard was it to, uh, towards the back end, you're getting commission checks that are legit, yeah. right? How hard is it to take a twenty-five thousand dollar commission check yeah. and not go buy something nice, but yeah. to just dump it off your student loans? So that's the the discipline thing. The adults desi- devise a plan and follow it. Kids do what feels good. Ooh. So look there at you some go. of that. That's like some redneck wisdom right that's there. A, that's that's a Dave quote. Redneck for sure. saying. Dang. <laughs> Man, sayings from a redneck man. I'm gonna, write, right. I'm gonna write a little book. I love it. <laughs> this is good. I like it. Good man. I'm proud of you. Appreciate it. Way to go. Who was your biggest cheerleader? Uh, good group. Of my fiance Amber sitting to the side. Way to go, Amber. And then uh, what we have self-proclaimed to be the big shovel gang is my buddy Eric and a couple other friends of ours who I are. I like this gang. <laughs> yeah. These are some guys making some coin and we being are. smart with it. Yeah. Big big podcast advocates. Oh well, we're honored, man. That's very cool. Shout out to the big shovel gang. Then. Yep. <laughs> I like it. Young guys making bank and doing smart stuff. Not being idiots with it. There you yeah. go, man. That's good. That's good. Life. Hey, that's how you change this country. Do I pay my my student loans off? Or do I buy a bunch of Bitcoin and gold? Well done, man. Yeah, well no done. Bitcoin. <laughs> Absolutely no Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, it would be worth half. Well, that 25 would be worth 10, so yeah. yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> All right. Well, man, this is incredible. Well done. What do you tell people the secret to getting out of debt is? Just stick into the plan. Follow it. It works. The the 80% behavior is absolutely the case because what John was saying, you know, you, you wake up at the end of the month and you've got a $30,000 commission check in your bank account. How do you not go and want to buy a car? But then you've got, you know, 80 grand left on your student loans. Feels a little bit better to get rid of that. Hey, you pointed out something. I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to fly by it. You've got a group of guys that are walking mm-hmm. through this yeah. with you. Mm-hmm. How important is community and accountability in doing any hard thing in life? Yeah, that's absolutely huge. So being able to bounce an idea off of them, this is what I'm thinking about. What do you guys think? And, you know, the, and then the they che- yell at you, stay on the plan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Of Absolutely. all the things you learned, stay, obviously you're going to keep on the money journey. You're going to be a baby step millionaire. You're going to be one tomorrow afternoon, right, <laughs> by, the way you're, by the way you're earning money and taking care of it. But don't forget the importance of having other men in your life that can speak into it, that you'll yep. listen to, and you'll submit yourself to, and vice versa. That's, yep. all, that's important, man. Good for you. That's a very, it's, it's, it's vital. The people that I know that are successful, you become who you hang around with. Yeah. So he's hanging around with the big shovel guy. The big shovel guy. <laughs> I just love the name. And it wasn't just the debt, too. I mean, I cash flowed uh, the wedding that we're having in April. I, wait, there was something else in there. Cash flowed this, the trip that we took to Nashville. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. We're, you know, we were able to get 15 down on a house mm-hmm. and got lucky with the market not being too crazy. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. before we know it, we'll pay off so Amber's. So is your fiance, is Amber debt free? She's close. Okay, so when you get married, yeah. you'll knock it out. Yeah, right? so we're going right. to knock good, that out in good, probably good. six months. Good, good. And well, no, in, in April. Yeah, yeah pretty much home. in April. When you Between come. now and then. Yeah, yeah. That's Very fantastic. good. Very good, man. You guys are rocking this. Way to go, brother. Boom, boom, Appreciate boom, it. Boom, boom, boom. Yes, yes, yes. So proud of you, man. Well done. 
Thank you. Well done. You're a hero. And uh, you're going some. You're going places, man. <laughs> this guy's smart as a whip. I love it. All right. Very, very good stuff. All right. Got a copy of uh, Baby Steps Millionaires for you. As John said, you'll be one in 20 minutes, so we need to make sure you have the manual. <laughs> That's the next chapter in your story on how to do this. And uh, you're, you're a rock star young man. I'm honored to meet you. And, uh, man, I, I need to do something with the big shovel gang. There's got to be something. <laughs> how many of them are there? Uh, including myself, four. Oh, okay, good. We're sending Baby Steps Millionaire books to all of them with you. That sounds good. Yeah, we'll sign them off for all of them. Yeah, we got to do something. This is just a good, great idea and a great uh, see, name. See, I'm I'm more interested in the the Redneck Millionaire T-shirt that I'm going to have printed up after oh, this show. Oh, I, I need credit on the licensing for both of those. Yeah, well, I, you you said Redneck Guru, and I ain't going with that. So you don't get no licensing. I'm I'm going with mine. But <laughs> this is fun. I love it. I love it. I love it. All right, count it down. 168,000 paid off in 21 months. Let's make it 65 to 292. Let's hear a debt free scream. Three, two, one. I'm debt free. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, baby. Way to go, brother. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. This is the Ramsey Show. today jackson san francisco hey jack welcome to the ramsey show good morning um mr ramsey how are you better than i deserve sir how can we help i want to know how do i use uh, cash distribution from a mutual fund under thirty three thousand dollars okay what do you need to do with it uh, what do you want to do with it uh well uh let me give you a little bit uh, of my background uh, I my net worth is about ten million dollars, and uh, I have no debt. Uh, everything is paid for, and uh, mostly my investments are in real estate. Good for you! Now, Amazing job. And now did you start with nothing and become a ten millionaire? Most likely, mostly. Yeah. Okay. I, I I become a ten million dollar millionaire in uh, ten years. Uh, I'm I'm at the retirement. Age uh, seventy two, and uh, I'm withdrawing. I'm getting my first year RMD to this year. Wow! That's why I withdraw the uh, hundred thirty three thousand mm-hmm. dollars from mutual funds, which I put in six thousand dollars before mm-hmm. and uh, thirty years ago, mm-hmm. and I didn't touch it. Mm-hmm. I got hundred thirty three thousand dollars. Wow! And uh, I have a. Uh, because of the tax situation of the RMD, I withdraw that from the um, mutual fund the last year. Right, you're required. To. Um, it's required yeah, minimum yeah, distributions yeah. at seventy two yeah. and a half. This and that's year why you're I have it. to do so, the. So I mean, if, you're, if you're ten million, if you have ten million dollars and you're completely debt free, and you have thirty three thousand dollars in your hand, the and what do I do with it? The answer is anything you want. You're a genius. It's oh, I, 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 it's 133. Okay, but it still doesn't matter. Yeah. If you burn yeah, it yeah. in the middle of but, your front yard, your life doesn't change. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I have a few options I want to go by you to see if uh, it's, a, it's a good investment or not. Okay. Number one, I can buy a tax-free uh, you know, bond or a okay. mutual what fund. Else? What else? What's number two? Uh, the other alternative is to buy a long-term care. Uh, you don't need long-term a, care. You have $10 million. I don't need long-term care? Yeah, you have $10 million. You can afford long-term care. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it seems I it only cost me $6,000. Uh, I know, but it only costs, costs $50,000 a year, and the average person uses it for two and a half years. 
That's 200, 300,000, 200,000 bucks, 300,000 bucks max out of your pocket out of 10 million. It's 3% of your net worth. You can self-insure through this. Don't pay, don't give an insurance company money. Self-insure through it. Besides that, a guy like you is probably going to hire somebody for in-home care anyway, private care. You're probably not going into a nursing home. Yeah, well, this this uh, this long-term care pays in home uh, care okay. too. Yeah, that's fine. If you want yeah, to buy it, you can buy I, it. I no, know I would not buy it. No, I would not buy a muni bond. What's your other choice? Um, those are the two choices I'm thinking oh, I of. You had three. I, I'm not going to splurge it. Yeah. I'm not splurging it. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm driving a two thousand dollar car, and uh, I have I've been happy with that. Okay. Uh, I'm not even buying a car. Okay. I, I want I want you to buy a car. Your car sucks. <laughs> You have $10 million. You need to go buy a car with this money. You don't have to spend $100,000 on the car, but you ought to not be driving a $2,000 car when you have $10 million. That's just, you need to have something more reliable, a little bit more enjoyable to get in, and it like starts every time and all that kind of crap. You know, so there's nothing wrong with a $2,000 car when you're broke and you're trying to get out of debt. But you, sir, have lived like no one else, and now you're able to live and give like no one else. The second thing I would tell you to do is I would be generous with some give of the money. Give some way, that's right. I want you to find someone or somewhere that you can put $10,000 or $30,000 that you give it away to be a blessing to someone and I want you to enjoy the smiles on their face and the change in your heart rate when you do that because it affects your body to quote John Deloney when you do things that are stressful and when you do things that are good it changes the chemistry of who you are and so I want you to give some, and I want you to enjoy some. And then with whatever's left, you ought to invest it. If you want to put it in a muni bond, you can. But, dude, you didn't make any of this money doing investments like muni bonds. You made all this money with mutual funds and real estate. And so I, I would dance with the girl that brought me on the investments. Uh, if you want to buy another piece of real estate, fine. If you want to uh, you know, use some mutual funds, I'd do that. But I, I personally wouldn't put anything in a muni bond. The returns suck. They're tax-free. But they suck. And uh, I, I just wouldn't do it. I'm 61. I'm right behind you a few years. I don't have any muni bonds. I don't own a single bond, uh, nor am I planning to in my life. <laughs> so, so Dave, what's the, what's the moment when, or maybe there never is, you've earned your money, like you've you've done well, and you're in your 60s now. Let's say you hit the magic. Is there a number when you, you stop? putting money into your investments and you just start enjoying it and giving it away? Or will right. that always be part of the rhythm? Because now we're talking great grandkids. Right. That we you, wanna... you, you, you want to keep the rhythm. Now, you can change your percentages. Sure. But you always ought to. Every check I get, I put it on one of three. I put some of the check on all three things. Okay. Some on investing, some on generosity, and some on enjoyment. Yeah. Now, the, the amount that I put on enjoyment these days is percentage-wise very small, but the checks are big. Right. And the life is already good before I got that check. <laughs> right. So I don't need a lot of to have an unbelievably luxurious life. Right. You know, I mean, not, not MTV music video life, but I mean, I've got a great life yeah. with a small percentage. But I always want to make sure I stop and go, I'm going to enjoy the moment. Yep. I just made some money. That's right. And the second thing is we're always going to increase our giving. We're always going to increase uh, our uh, investments. But these days, the larger percentage goes to generosity. Mm -hmm. But I still do some to investing. It's systematically still growing. In. I don't need more. That's what, I, that's what I'm asking. Even the kids and grandkids don't need more. Right. But the more investments you have, the more they throw off and the more generous you can be. There you go. Okay. So it's the goose that lays the generous eggs. There you go. Huh? After a while. I mean, you're creating a family foundation. Yeah. You're creating a family of that has a uh, net worth that is continually generous over time, mm. not just yourself. And that's not just, you know, buying somebody's gas at, at the gas station, which is always fun, too. Of course, that's, that's, that's where it yeah. starts. Yeah. But, yeah, you need, to, you need to always be doing all three. And that's with your 4-year-old and with your 84-year-old. There you go. Okay. Spencer is in Orange County. Uh, Spencer, how are you? Hey, Dave. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Great. How can we help? Uh, so I am a young father. Well, I'm not necessarily young. I'm 34 years old and I've got one boy who's two and another one on the way. Yay. Good and for you. My, yeah. Thanks guys. And, uh, I got to get out of California. I <laughs> can't stand it here. So okay. my wife just paid, we just paid off our student loan and, uh, we, uh, want to move back to Utah with family. The housing market in Utah is terrifying, but my whole life I've always just taken it one step at a time and, we're out of debt. We have no debt. Uh, we just paid off student loans. So now we've got about $60,000 saved for a 
down payment on a home. You do not um, own a home in Orange in, County. We do not own a home in Orange County. Okay. We are renting cool. right So now. you're moving and you're buying a house. Yeah, well, that's that's the plan. That's yeah. what we want to do. But okay. I guess my – is that like – I've been, never been great with money, but we do have money saved up. That's and, fine. And uh, if you're 100% debt that, free, I think you're great with money. Well, okay. So well, don't say that. Ever, don't say that ever again. Yeah, you're in rare air, brother. And Pretty then the other thing, you have an emergency um, fund in addition to the 60, or is the 60 all you got? Yeah, no, 60 for the house payment alone, and then 30,000 for about just other things. So we have Good. about 30,000 in the emergency fund. Good. We haven't um, Good. divided it perfectly. What trimester is your wife question, in? Sorry, say that again. What trimester is your wife in? Wait. You said she's pregnant. I did not. Yeah, yeah. She, oh, so trimester. Sorry. Yeah. She's in the second trimester. She's 21 weeks along. Okay. You don't move until yeah. the baby comes. Yeah, we're going to have the baby first, and Good. we're planning on moving Good. early 2023. That's husband advice. Um, <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> yeah. just one guy not to see. You want to have some fun? Move a pregnant lady. That's fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, just not, I just don't know. I just don't know what to do next. I mean, we want to have the baby and, and go to, to Utah and so. buy a house. You can do it. Is that is that is it as simple as that? It is yes. as simple as that. You are you got it, man. Or if you move if you move to Utah and rent for a year, nobody's gonna your life will still be great. Yeah, and then buy a house out during that year sometime once you get to know the area a yeah. little bit and you get a little bit through some of the craziness of a newborn. I'm assuming you got a job lined up over there, Spencer. But as long as you got income lined up, load up the truck truck and head to Beverly. It's the opposite, actually, now. We're not going to Beverly anymore, but there you go. This is The Ramsey Show. Have a friend or family member that needs a daily dose of Ramsey advice in their life? Let them know about the Ramsey Call of the Day podcast. It's a quick hit of advice about life and money in under 10 minutes. Check out the Ramsey Call of the Day podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, it's the Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host, Dr. John Deloney of the Dr. John Deloney Show and uh, best-selling author of the book, Redefining Anxiety, is my co-host today as we talk about your relationships, your work, your money, and your life right here on The Ramsey Show, like we do every day. Open phones at 888-825-5225. That's 888 Dawn is with us. Dawn's in Cincinnati. Hi, Dawn. Welcome to The Ramsey Show. Hi, thanks for taking my call. We love your show. Thanks for what you do. Well, thank you. How can we help today? Yeah, um, so I have a niece. She'll be the first one to go to college in her family, and um, she wants to be a teacher. And we listen to your show enough to know the college should coincide with the career path you choose and when it comes to what you're willing to pay. She has received an $18,000 scholarship, but she would like to go to Xavier University, which is about 52 a year. Um, and she wants to graduate with her teaching degree. And my brother has tried over and over to tell her that that is not a good choice. She's even gotten a full ride to a quote unquote, in her mind, lesser school. Um, he's even tried to bribe her. Um, saying, go to that school and I'll pay for your final year at Xavier and then you can graduate from there. She's just not listening to any of us. And we don't want her to get, you know, having eighty dollars to $100,000 in debt being a teacher. Um, so do you have any resources or what have you done in the past to maybe help these kids to realize this probably isn't the best decision? Duct tape. 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and bailing wire. You can go to Tractor Supply, your local Tractor Supply, and get all of your... Get a chair. Duct tape yeah, to a yeah. chair. <laughs> I'm kidding. Right? I'm kidding. I'm tempted, but oh my gosh. So she's a stubborn brat teenager. Uh, definitely. Yeah. And usually those are formed by stubborn brat parents. And she's already an education snob. <laughs> yes. So John, uh, John has a Ph.D. in higher ed and has been the uh, dean of students at expensive schools and um, other various important positions at expensive schools. So what do you, how do you fix this, John? Well, there, you got you got a couple of problems here. One is is usually this attitude is formed somewhere in the home, right? So often parents will try to wait to the last minute and correct behavior that they may have been a part of, and so. If there's any sort of elitism or they're dumb, I can't believe they're driving that car, that's where a parent sits down with a teenager and says, hey, my attitude has been wrong for the last 15 years, and I'm sorry. Right? That's not going to cure this problem overnight, but that's like you've got to start with that level of humility. And normally, not always, but this kind of attitude that I see in 17-year-olds and 18-year-olds, come on, man, um, that usually comes somewhere from inside the house. The second thing is, is this – some places you can, some you can't, some it's hard. I would re- I would sit down and say I will not co-sign for anything. I will not. At some point, you got to draw some really hard boundaries. Um, I'm not going to support this. You're not going to take my car with you. You're not going to take my phone plan with you. Some of these things sound draconian and mean, but you're trying to keep a kid from making a hundred thousand dollars mistake, right? With a not with an unformed brain, right? <laughs> Their brain is not fully formed at 17. You're holding a a a uh, uh, a full ride to a state school, right? It, it's it it just doesn't work mathematically. It doesn't work professionally. And here's another thing I would do: I would get a teacher that this person that that she trusts. Oh, that's good. It's got yeah. student loan debt, and you say I will pay for the dinner, or I'll de- the parents will pay for coffee. And go say, go sit down and ask them if it's worth it. Because I had this happen. My friend Randall, I had coached basketball at the high school level, and then I was uh, working at a university. And his son was five or six, and he said, "This is so obnoxious. Will you go outside and tell my son to dribble the basketball like this?" I said, "Why don't you go tell him?" And he goes, "Because he's going to listen to you right now." And so there's something about somebody else saying it sometimes. And so send her out with a teacher that she respects and looks up to, and that teacher will hopefully set her right. That's good. Thank you for that. Appreciate but at the end it. of the day, parents really like I I've heard this uh, uh, once. I heard a thousand times. Well, I'm not going to like take away their car, or their phone. I'm still going to put five hundred dollars in their account every month. I just think they're making a bad decision. And I always no, you're look financing at, their bad. That's decision. right. I would look at the parent and say, how far are you willing to support your kid making bad choices? Yeah. Right. I mean, I'm not going to take away their car. They're only doing cocaine. I mean, it's not a problem. <laughs> like, you know, that's the kind of thing. So, yeah, it's... Um, and going to a private school is not mean you're doing cocaine, but you know what we're saying here, right? You're financing yeah. the 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 lack of wisdom there. So what we used to tell our teens uh, about various things because was that um, I would look at one of them that was losing their mind and they're 16 years old and I would say, listen, there's two people that live inside your body right now. There's a four-year-old and a 34-year-old. If I can talk to the 34-year-old, we'll have a discussion about persuasion. If I'm talking to the 4-year-old, I'm going to freaking tell you what to do, and I'm going to make you do it physically. Now, like I would a 4-year-old, you're going to behave in my house. Now, we can discuss this, and I can tell you why that's important and why you're building character, and we can have a persuasive discussion, or I can just make you. Now, what do we want to do here? And so, and I'm going to do that here. I'm going to just sit down and say, this is a dumb but asinine decision. And I feel like I'm negotiating with you like you hold any cards in your hand. You don't hold any cards. I have all the freaking money. I own your life. You are not an adult. I still get to tell you what to do. And so now we can have a discussion like two logical adults about this. And Xavier is not evil, but the number of schools that she applies to go to, you apply to go to school to, honey, that actually care where you got your teaching degree is precisely zero. Unless you want to work at Xavier. And then they will care that you went to Xavier. Mm -hmm. But short of that, 
you know, you're signing up for Cincinnati City Public Schools, zero chance you get the job because you went to Xavier versus went to the other school. Absolutely, precisely zero. There is no data on the planet to justify this aristocracy crap in higher ed that these famous schools that are triple, quadruple, 5x expensive are worth a penny more than the others. They're not. Now, might you learn a little bit more? Maybe. But the idea that you're going to do better as a teacher, the idea you're going to your career is going to be on a fast track because you paid 5x is zero. It's a it's asinine. I want I want to know why 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 does she want to go to Xavier? Why is she so set on it? Well, um, she said that it is one of the best programs uh, in the state for teaching. So, so here's what I want to do. I hear that from teenagers all the time. Prove it. Show me. Sit down and show me what the, what the rankings mean, where the front. I want you to prove that it's a $100,000 difference. Why is this car worth $100,000 more than this other car? Show me. Prove it. We'll prove 17 it. 17-year-old, prove it. Both of them will get you to the market. That's right. If you're considering a career in technology, I recommend Bethel Tech, and I'm not alone. Here's what Brendan said. Before Bethel Tech, I was driving Uber. Within four months of graduating, I got a job paying $60,000. About two years after that, I got a remote job that pays me $130,000, all thanks to what I learned at Bethel Tech. You could be next. Get started today at BethelTech.net and get $1,000 to $2,500 off of your tuition. Again, it's BethelTech.net slash Ken Coleman. John Deloney, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Many of you have been filing your taxes with the same software for years, but you're sick and tired of having add-on fees and them trying to sell you everything else under the sun, loans and credit cards and everything else. You've probably seen all the tax software ads saying it's free with the big companies, but the reality is for most people it's not free. And by the time you realize you don't meet the, quote, free criteria, you put in too much time to start over somewhere else, so you pay up. Folks are making a killing off of you, and we think you deserve better. That's why we're offering Ramsey Smart Tax, so you can file your taxes online without paying more than you'd expect. It's a very simple pricing structure. It is what it is. Very inexpensive, very easy to do, but you got to switch. Ramsey Smart Tax includes every form that you need, no hidden fees, no surprises. Have a promo code right now so you can file the federal part of your taxes for free. And if you have a beefed up thing, you'll pay a little more, but the federal part's free with a promo code. So be sure, if you prefer to have a priority support extended audit protection, you can go with a premium version for just $20. That's a deal. So if you're ready to ditch these other guys surprising you with fees and all kinds of other garbage, save on your taxes. Go to RamseySolutions.com slash smart tax. Get started right now. RamseySolutions.com slash smart tax. Jason is with us in Louisville, Kentucky. Hi, Jason. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, guys. Thank you both so much for taking my call. I appreciate it. Sure. What's up? Well, Dave, I, uh, I'm really thankful to be, uh, because of you living, uh, a really enjoyable, uh, debt-free life. Good for you. And, um, I appreciate all that you've done, uh, to help, uh, help me get there. 
Uh, I'm 47 years old, and I am. Um, I work part time as a pastor uh, in a church, and my payment um, from the church is actually a house to live in. Uh-huh. Uh, includes all the utilities, and uh, I have virtually zero housing expenses, um, and that is my payment. But I'm by vocation, also I I work uh, elsewhere, and I work. Um, I make about forty forty two thousand a year. Uh-huh. Um, and so again, I'm I'm fully through baby step three. This is my year to start baby step four uh, to be able to start socking away uh, money for the future. Good. Are you um, single? I'm a little kid. I am single. Okay. Yep. Right. Yep. Okay. I'm divorced, okay. uh, unfortunately, but uh, it's where I'm at in my life. And sure. I have two adult kids. Um, neither of them chose college. Um, they are, have both joined the workforce, and they're doing fine in their industries. And so I'm a little confused on a couple of things, uh, kind of what maybe a next, the next baby step actually is for me, uh, because I'm, I'm uncertain if – you know, where exactly my ministry career will take me. Um, it could be that I end up moving elsewhere and, you know, living in a parsonage kind of long term. Uh-huh. Um, uh, I just don't know if, you know, if I should really be kind of setting aside money for a house uh-huh. or if it's OK to just sort of be in a rental situation indefinitely. Uh-huh. Um, so where where exactly I land in terms of baby steps, you know, five and six, I'm not really sure. Good for you. And so well, you've done really well. Congratulations. Done great job. Well, the, Thanks, uh, the thing is this, it. you know, free rent's free rent. We're not going to argue with free. Uh, sure. but, but what we've got to think about is what you're going to be doing when you're 65, what you're going to be doing when you're 70, what you're going to be doing when you're 75. Yep. Yep. And we have to think ahead on that. And a lot of pastors that have a, a, a long time, long term uh, parsonage situation uh, get in a mess when they retire. Yeah. They don't have a place yep. to live. And, uh, yep. you you know, so let's say you retired at 65 and you lived to 85. You have 20 years of rent increasing during that time. Plus, sure. rent has increased during the time you did this. So what you've got to yep. do is you have to start saving for a house. You don't have to buy one. Okay. But you need sure. to start saving for one. And, you know, and then depending on what your uh, parsonage offerings are with this with this situation or other situations in the future – then that will activate whether you actually purchase or not. If you actually got an okay. aw- awesome pastoral opportunity, great income, great uh, situation, strong governance in the church, and you wanted to be there, and you can move into that ministerial, mm-hmm. that pastoral situation, there's no parsonage, and you got $100,000 in a mutual fund for a house, then you would go buy a house. And you wouldn't have okay. to think yeah. about it. Mm-hmm. Oh, I don't know if I can take this great job because it doesn't have a parsonage. Right, right. Right. Yep. And so you, you makes I, sense. Yeah, I want you to be able to make the transfer or be able to retire. But at some point in the equation, before you die, you're gonna own a house because it stabilizes your older years. Sure, sure. Now then that all makes that all makes perfect sense. Now in the with the income that I have um in the low forties, um if I'm if I'm socking away fifteen percent, that's about you know, about six thousand a year or so mm-hmm. uh, for retirement. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, is there a, a good recommended percentage that I should look at by the end of the year to to say this is my house fund? No. Or um, no, it's whatever okay. you want to. Obviously, gotcha. the bigger okay. the house fund, the better the situation. But obviously, the bigger the sure. house fund, the less is left over for you to eat out of forty k. Right. Right. So it's a straight. It's a straight trade off. Yeah. I mean, yeah. If you if you, my, if, you ma- if you match the living. retirement, and you put six thousand away for a house, and you'd have sixty thousand plus all the growth. You probably have two hundred thousand in ten years if you matched it um, in good mutual funds. And so, but I don't know if you can do that or not, and still have a reasonable life. That's twelve thousand dollars out of your forty, and you've got taxes coming out, but you don't have any housing expense, um, and you don't have any utility, utility expense. expense. So yeah. you, you know that gives you that's pretty much like having a sixty thousand dollar job. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I think you could probably do that, but, uh, I'd want to be trying to do that if you can make your budget work at that. But obviously it's kind of the equation is the more you put in, the more you're going to have. Yeah. And I think there's, a, it's good to differentiate between long-term renting and long-term free house, right? Those are two different things. Yeah, too. I would never tell you long-term rent. Right. I'd tell you short-term rent. Sure. Till you don't have to. Right. Uh, but until you're not broke because broke people don't need to buy houses, but, uh, but free house. 
Well, sit there in the free house. Take a free house. That's yeah. right. Yeah. I mean, you sit there for 30 years and free house yep. and, and pile up money. And so then when it's over and you retire, you go buy a house. That's right. But I have t- I've counseled with way too many pastors oh, and ministers. Too. I've got nothing. Who got trapped in two things and the two things knocked them out was they have unbelievably wonderful hearts and their generosity to people who come come across their path is bonkers good and uh then the uh and the second thing is they've been sitting in the parsonage in some cases and they've done nothing about housing so between their generosity and nothing about housing then they lose the parsonage upon retirement <sighs> they're really up a creek that's exactly right and uh it, it leaves them like basically they got some retirement savings but they're also broke right and that, that's and nowhere what, to live. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's a problem. It's just a real problem. So hey, just be careful. Hey, I want to take a second. Congratulations, man. Your book crushed. Got your, it, man. It your did. book. The, the, the team did a great the job. The trifecta. Yeah, but you wrote a great book, man. It was. Uh, it's, uh, Congratulations. It, yeah. It, it, I'm, I'm proud of it. I'm proud of our team, the marketing. On it. Thank you. If you didn't know, Baby Steps Millionaires was number one on all the lists all uh, last week. Everything. So and there um, was some juggernauts out there, too, man. Like you came in on top. That's, that's, there's some big books. There's some out real there. authors. We beat some real authors. No, I'm just saying there's some big guys that I, if I had been planning it, I would have said, let's not do it on that weekend. Man, you came. Yeah, I, I, honestly, Glenn Beck's a friend of mine, and I would not have launched a book the same week he did. Yeah. And we did accidentally. And if it, if he and I had both known it, we would have scheduled around it. <laughs> right. But we just didn't didn't compare notes on that because well, neither think, one of us wanted to bump heads with I the other one. I think every human on the planet now has bought a copy of Atomic Habits and that book. And but I mean, you came across all of them, man. Yeah. It's just really. Really and James remarkable. is a friend. Uh, I love James. James yeah, is incredible. incredible Atomic Habits is a great book. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, like the top three right now, one, two, three, or uh, I, I don't know if James knows Glenn or not, but I bet he does. I don't know. I yeah. wouldn't be shocked if he doesn't. So, uh, but congratulations, man. That's really, that's big time. Good guys, good guys. And Donald Miller had a book come out last yeah, week. Yeah, Donald's a great author, too. Yeah. Man. yeah. So, a lot, of, a lot of great stuff happening. And I didn't know his was coming out, but they, and I know him good. But anyway, anyway, anyway whatever. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. This is The Ramsey Show. Dr. John Deloney, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. In the lobby of Ramsey Solutions on the debt-free stage, James and Kathleen are with us. Hey, guys, how are you? Doing great, great, thanks. Welcome. Where do you guys live? We're from Houston, Texas. All right. Welcome, (laughs) welcome. Good to have you. Welcome. And how much debt have you guys paid off? We have paid off 133,044 months. Ooh. In 44 months? Yes, yeah. Very wow. good. Where in Houston? Uh, South City. Ellington area. Okay. Yeah. Good. Cool. cool. And your range of income during that 44 months? We went from 127 to 153. Cool. What do you all do for a living? I'm in the hotel industry. Mm-hmm. I'm a marketing manager with the insurance firm. Great. Very awesome, good. Guys. Cool. So what kind of debt was your 133000 Oh, it was a mix of credit cards, uh, car loans, personal loans, uh, lawyer fees, and then the bulk of it was my school loans. So you were like normal. Yes. Yeah. Just normal people. <laughs> Pretty normal good mix, people. yeah. Just walking along here, making 127000 broke. Yep. <laughs> yep. Okay. So what happened 44 months ago? What was the wake-up call? How'd you get connected to Ramsey? So we were married in 2015. Um, around that time, you happened to come in with the rest of your uh, financial team, your daughter and a few others uh, mm-hmm. to Grace Church. Yeah, and, um, yeah, I remember. So we attended that, and it was just kind of a really big push for us. And then Harvey hit in 2017. Yep. And when we realized, hey, insurance is gonna, not going to cover it, mm-hmm. savings not going to cover it, um, it was a really big wake-up call for us to say we need to 
wipe it, wipe the slate clean and make a new future for, for our family. Wow. Yeah. Okay, cool. So you kind of knew about the stuff, but the hurricane and the aftermath of that was the, the wake-up call where you said, okay, we got to get serious. Yeah, we had to hit ground zero, of course. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Wow. But yeah, once we um, realized we had to take a personal uh, loan out just to help cover what insurance could in and the depleting of the savings, I don't think we ever wanted to feel that way again. Right. right. Yeah. It took you right down to the edge. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. And so what got torn up that insurance didn't cover? Uh, just in general, it was uh, some electrical... Um, it's also the package, you know. I think you have certain insurance packages in terms of flood insurance that you go in. Oh with. no, flood so insurance! You got flooded. We had flood insurance. Yeah. Just again, I think some of the co- or some of the expenses were a little bit higher than we had expected. Right. Okay. Um, so that's what was a difficult. That's a horrible thing to go through, and to add financial problems on top of it makes it double bad. And then yeah. um, finding out we're pregnant six weeks later oh, after the oh, hurricane. Wow. <laughs> of course you did. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Wow. Yes. Very cool. So. so Y'all make a great salary. And when you're digging out of a hole like this over several years, your friends look at you like you're crazy. Yeah. How How is that? Y'all are two young, good-looking folks. Y'all are hitting it in Houston, having fun. And you got to say no to ball games. you got to say no to concerts. Mm-hmm. Man, walk us through that. How is that? It's tough. Uh, it really is. You know, you get a, a lot of the family even, aside from the friends, they, they just they don't get it. They say, well... You, you know, you've got the extra cash. You have to have the extra cash and, you know, well, or just put it on a card. And, you know, we it, we really had to put our foot down and say, no, nope, tear up the cards, cut them up. Just keep paying on them, paying on them. You know, we'll we'll do the movie night at home, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, and, and, and it's, it's hard when family it, reaches out and say, "Hey, can you help? We know you're we know you're doing well. Can you help us out with some money? Or we need some help, or you know, cousin so and so." That's hard, right? Yeah, very. Yeah, um, I will tell you, we love to travel, mm. um, and we traveled on somebody else's, bit, you know, a credit card every time, and that was the hardest part for us is uh, four years without, or that forty-four months without the traveling. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is our first, you know, trip since um, right. before yeah. we took the chance. So <laughs> Nashville is an awesome Welcome to place. Nashville. <laughs> I love it. Thank. So yeah, for yeah. folks listening who who can't put their head like I can't tell my friends no, what does it feel like to get those checks deposited and you have no other bills and now. they're just sitting there looking at you? It's beautiful. It's yeah, crazy. It it's got to be bananas, right? It is surreal because you're so used to um, paying on something and now we're on baby step three and just putting that in the in the bank account. It feels very freeing. It's um, it, there's a little little bit of liberation in our marriage where we're just don't have to worry about anything if yeah, there is an emergency yeah. that comes up we just pay it and it's not even a conversation anymore and and you get to keep your own money yeah, yeah. that's yeah. so cool what an yeah. amazing idea yes yeah, <laughs> yeah. so well, um, we, we even had a, a vehicle mishap you know a couple of weeks ago and it was one of those situations where we look at each other and go well the emergency fund, the emergency fund is there yeah. mm-hmm. and you know we like see you pay it and and you move on you just keep Keep trucking. Turns a crisis into an inconvenience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You guys are fun. Way to go, I mean, guys! <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Who were your biggest? Uh, who were your biggest cheerleaders outside the two of you? You know, it was really a couple's. We had to be each other's. Um, I'd say cheerleaders and accountability partners because it was very difficult for our family and friends to understand. They were amazing cheerleaders. It was like cheering on for a team you didn't know. You know what they, what, were what they were doing, but uh, I think in terms of understanding, we did have a we were in FPU at a Grace Church, mm-hmm. and uh, they our church members really understood. Okay, mm-hmm. yes, please keep going, keep mm-hmm. going. Um, but uh, it it was each other that yeah. really kind of put each other through the ringer in terms of, you know, who's the spender, who's the saver, how do we control that, and um, how do we push. And, and complete this goal. And so that really helped out. Did both of you grow up in homes that were not debt-free? Yes. Oh, yeah. We, I, we did not understand the concept of money yet in my home. So I see those two beautiful little ones over here. What's, what's it like knowing that they're going to grow up in a home that doesn't didn't go through what y'all went through? I mean, y'all, y'all put it in the work for a couple of years, and, and their whole life's going to be different because of that. Yeah. I want yeah, to say no, that it, it's uh, great. Yeah, Isaiah. After a while, I was like, "Mom, we don't have to go out to eat. We can eat at home." Or, uh, he's he he really understood very quickly what it is to keep money in the bank, um, not be debt free. And we're constantly talking about money mm-hmm. at the dinner table, which we think is healthy. I yeah. mean, we need to talk about money more regularly and understand what what um, 
what it means. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'm so proud of y'all, man. Way to go, you guys. Days. Way to go. So Touchdown. <laughs> yes, well sir. done, well done. How's it feel now that you're free? Well, it feels great. I mean, like she said, this is honestly our first family vacation in four years. Yeah. You know, aside from maybe an overnight stay. Was it worth it? A couple it? hours yes, away. Sir. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. very much worth it. And because we're just... It, you know, it's, it's out of pocket. It's cash. And, you know, we go back to work, get another paycheck, and just keep, <laughs> keep trucking. You know, yeah. we don't have to worry about... You know, when the bill shows up, oh, that was that Nashville trip mm-hmm. or, or anything else like yeah. that. And Christmases are kind of best vacation yeah. that there is. Fun. Yeah. yeah, best vacation that there is. One doesn't follow you home. Right, yeah. right. I mean, that's just awesome. Way to go, you guys. We've got a copy of Baby Steps Millionaires for you. Okay. As we were just discussing, number one bestseller, and that's the next chapter in your story. To go on and become millionaires. Yes, sir. Something else maybe your bunch hadn't done before. <laughs> Not many bunches have, I'll just tell you that. And it's a okay. special thing. You guys yes. are incredible. And copy of Total Money Makeover for you to give to someone, disturb their life. It'd be a good thing for them to be a little bit disturbed. Yes, so yeah. good stuff. Very, very cool. Congratulations. Awesome. All right, let's bring the kiddos in. What are their names and ages right quick? Uh, Isaiah, mm-hmm. he's 12, mm-hmm. and Veronica Jane is 3. All right, there we go. Veronica Jane, has she got this figured out? Yes, sir. I She's love been practicing. It. <laughs> I love it. All right, 133000 paid off in 44 months, making 127000 to 153. Count it down. Let's hear a debt free scream. Three, two, two one. one. We're, We're debt free. Hey, Veronica, Janie had that down. Hey. Not she, bad at three. Well done. Dialed in. The family tree has been changed. I love it. That's what happens, man. That pretty little girl, she has no idea what her mom and dad have done. Oh, man. It's powerful. But Isaiah does. He knows. He yeah. Got to see He's it. old enough. He got to see the arc and feel it, and now his language has changed. His thoughts have changed. Man. Yeah. So Rachel was about that age. Yep. You know, when we did that. And it's just, uh, whew. You look now where she is and where her, her kids are. Yeah. You really did change your family tree. It's powerful. This is The Ramsey Show. Ramsey personality co-hosting today. He's host of the Dr. John Deloney Show, and uh, you ought to tune into it on Ramsey Network's podcast. It is uh, exploding in popularity, and you get to ask questions about relationships and all kinds of mental health things, and you can today as well. If you want to jump in, the phone number is 888-825-5225. John's in Kansas City. Hey, John, welcome to the Ramsey Show. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you taking the call. Sure. How can um, we help? Uh, my wife and I pastor a small church, and uh, we've been FPU coordinators and uh, have trained other people in that. Thank you. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm not saying this for accolades, but I, uh, every time we marry someone, we give them a copy of the total money makeover and wow, write a note you. in there to follow the biblical principles that are in this book. And many of them have gotten debt-free. Um, my issue today is um, I'm 66. I don't have much money uh, saved for retirement. Um, we don't make a lot of money. But like I said, we pastor a small church, and there's been times we've had to skip taking a paycheck, uh, that kind of thing. My wife does work outside the home, where we're both uh, receiving Social Security now, um, so it supplements our income. But um, I don't have a lot of money saved. I'm just concerned about, you know, we're going to have enough money to live on when it's all said and done. Uh, we, we're debt free except for our house. We don't owe a lot of money on that. What do you um, owe on the house? Oh, eighty-five thousand on the house. Okay. And it's worth six hundred. And how much nest egg have you got? 
Uh, about thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars. Yes. Okay. All right. And what's your household income these days? Uh, we're about seventy thousand uh, dollars, including everything. Okay. Um, and are both of you planning to stay in the same uh, work situation for the next few years? Yes. Yeah, I, I plan to stay here. You know, it's uh, it's not a career choice with me. It's yeah. actually a calling. And I appreciate that. Uh, uh, otherwise, I might have, might have had something that had a better look for something that had a better pay package. But it's really it's really not about that. It's about ministering to people. And, Absolutely. And this Maybe is just where I'm at. You have you know. a great heart. And so, uh, you know, what I would tell you is, I got two goals for you in five years. Perfect. I'm ready for you. Get the house paid off and put a hundred thousand dollars in mutual funds. Okay. Still not going to be enough. Still not going to be enough. But, uh-huh. you, but you'll be seventy-one, and you'd have a hundred and uh, hundred and seventy, approaching two hundred thousand dollars in there with the growth of the thirty-five if it's in mutual funds. And um, okay. so you'd be approaching two hundred thousand and a paid-for six hundred thousand dollar house. If you can't make it, at least we know you can sell the house and move to a four hundred thousand dollars house. Well, absolutely, yeah, we've yeah. considered that. Uh, I wouldn't do it today, and, but that's your that's no. your fallback plan. But if you could get the house paid off and put two hundred away, I think you could make it. Well, uh, I'm, we're we're fast tracking the house. We're paying an additional eighteen hundred dollars a month against the principal, and it it looks to pay out in two and a half years. That's perfect. And, uh, meanwhile, so, meanwhile, you got to do more than that. In addition, into retirement, because I need to get a hundred in five years. That's twenty thousand bucks. That's another fifteen hundred. That's another eighteen hundred a month. Okay, so I need to be putting another eighteen hundred away into. The I just made that number fund. up, Pastor. I mean, I just made it up. You it's did? not. It's not a trick number. I just was okay. looking at a seventy thousand dollar income, and I thought, uh-huh. how much can can we squeeze out of this turnip? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. And I'm yeah. thinking there's no magic to it. I mean, if I could have you have do have a million when you retired, I'd do it, but I don't see that in the numbers. I'm trying to do something where you can eat and still pull yeah. this off and get some margin between you and the wolf. Okay. Okay. And, and so well, that's reasonable. That's, yeah, uh, so that's, if you that's, saved that's eighteen if you saved eighteen hundred, that'd be twenty thousand. You did that for five years, that'd be a hundred thousand. Plus it will grow some during that, plus your thirty five will grow some during that. So that'll bump you pretty close to two hundred. Okay. In your mutual funds. Well, and then you'd have a paid for a six hundred thousand dollar house. You're almost a millionaire at that point. Wow. I never thought about it like that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, well that's a five that's five more of years of working like you're working now, her too. Okay, perfect. Well, I just need to get a hold of one of your ELPs and help me with the Roth thing. I don't yeah. quite understand all yeah. of that. So Jump on SmartVestor, anyway. SmartVestor at RamseySolutions.com, and thank you for your heart and uh, your service. And, you know, we were just talking about that a minute ago with parsonages. Yeah. is a little different subject, but uh, gentle, big heart, call, call a God on his life without a doubt. And he's staring down the barrel of retirement. He's got 30000 bucks in the bank. Yeah. All right. Luckily, got, he's got a house. He's got, got a great got house. Got to do situation. something about it. And good news is, he can do something about it still. Um, it's not going to be fancy, but he can do something about it. Right. So the house may end up being the answer before it's over, but hopefully not. Hopefully, we can work it through without selling it if they don't want to sell it. Yeah. But he even held that with an open hand. You hear that? Yep. This guy's right. spiritual maturity is amazing. Yeah. Beautiful man. Beautiful man. Love it. Cynthia is with us. Cynthia is in Des Moines, Iowa. Hi, Cynthia. How are you? Hi, Dave. Doing great. Okay. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. Um, I just have a quick question. So I am on, I am hoping to get on to Baby Step 4 really soon. Mm-hmm. So my question is around Baby Step 4. Um, I'm wanting to contribute about 15% to my 401k. Great. Hoping like this next paycheck or possibly in February. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm noticing that the market is, well, it's in the toilet. So yeah. Should I really contribute at this time, or should I skip it and move on to like something else? Or when I was a little kid, that? my my mama would take us to a store called Kmart. Yep. And Kmart would, in the middle of the day, run these little sales. They called them blue light special. Blue light special. And they would turn on a blue light over the top of the whatever area, and uh, you could go over there and get you a coffee pot on sale or whatever. That's what you're. That's what we're having right now, darling. This is called a blue light special. You need to Stock buy while it's on sale. Buy while it's on sale. Okay, so buy at the dip. Okay. So you know why? How old are you? 
Uh, I'm 40-ish. Okay, 40-ish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Own it, own it. I'm 61. I'm right, proud of it. So there you go. But the uh, uh, yeah. So here's the thing. Uh, uh, in 20 years, where do you think an average of companies that sound like this? Apple, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Boeing, Microsoft, Home Depot, an a- on average as a group, now there'll be some one or two that fail, but on average as a group, an aggregate of that group 20 years from now, are they going to be worth more or less? Well, ideally more. Well, not only ideally, there would be the, the <laughs> that's what has always happened in history 100% of the time so far in the American stock market's history. Now, obviously, the world can fall apart, and we can just blow this whole thing up called America. But if anything stays similar to what it is, 20 years from today, it's going to be up, and you will be glad that you bought in the cold winter of 2022 when the market was freezing to death and down because of whatever was going on out there. I haven't There's even seen. Is always it, something going on. How far down is it? I haven't even looked. I dropped 500 points in one day the other day, but oh. it's just it's back and forth. Let me say out of 30,000. 500 yeah. points used to be a lot. It's not anymore. But, yeah, yeah it's uh, Ukraine and, uh, yeah. and Biden mumbling, and mm. they can't, nobody, you know, nobody's got any uh, idea that he's going to do anything, and mm. so the market's just unstable. Yeah. Geopolitical crap always destabilizes the market. That's it always right. has. I mean, this little thing happens on the other side of the world, and boom, all of a sudden. Because right. people just have this little black cloud following them around on Wall Street. Just waiting for the next wait, bad wait, thing. Waiting on the next bad thing, and then they're as psychological as it can be. Mm. But uh, um, Bitcoin's in half. Oh, God, who knew? <laughs> who knew that was going to happen? And so um, Anybody with investing wisdom of more than 8 to 10 years? Yeah, yeah, that's true. But, um, yeah, fairly, fairly easy predictor. But fairly, you know, easy predictor. And this is just a... You know, uh, it is a geopolitical driven. It's not economic driven and it's not profits. The profits of the companies involved have not changed. So are they suddenly worth less? Right. No, they're so worth what they were worth. Yeah. It's just they're scared they might be down in the future because of war with Russia or China or destabilization of the political environment, all that kind of crap. So do I think all that's going to happen? Nope. I think there's going to be problems, and there's going to be times when there's not problems. And the market's going to go up, and the market's going to go down. And I, only people get hurt on a roller coaster are those that jump off in the middle of the ride. Dr. John Deloney, good hour. Good hour to Ben Kelly and James in the booth. I am Dave Ramsey, your host. We'll be back with you before you know it. Kelly, associate producer and phone screener for The Ramsey Show. If you would like to do your debt-free screen live on the show, make sure you visit theramseyshow.com and register. We would love for you to come to Nashville and tell Dave your story. This is The Ramsey Show. Intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, it's the Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host. Dr. John Deloney, Ramsey personality, best-selling author, is my co-host today. We're taking your calls. They're free, and some say the advice is worth exactly what you pay for it. Phone number is 888 5225 We'll be talking about your relationships, your mental health, things in your family, your money, your work, your career. We talk about your life. Right here on the Ramsey Show, triple eight eight two five five two two five. Heidi is with us in Atlanta. Hey, Heidi, welcome to the Ramsey Show. Thank you for having me and talking to me today. How are you? Sure. What's up? 
Um, I'm in a little bit of a predicament. Um, I'm coming to the realization that I'm having to possibly make some decisions that are not only financial. I'm having trouble understanding you. Can you speak directly into your phone, please? Sounds muffled. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. A little better. Go ahead and try again. Talk bold. Talk bold. Um, yeah. It's just you Um, and me and Dave and like 10 million other people. It's good. Yeah, exactly. Um, I can't speak too loudly because my husband's downstairs and I don't want to be interrupted by him. Um, so I'm in a situation where, um, my husband's not wanting to work on our finances together. Um, this last two and a half years, he has not been contributing towards our, uh, joint account at all. Money is completely separated. And uh, recently he informed me that um, if I want my financial situation to change, I have to do something about it. Um, Because I've suggested to him, I've been listening to you for the last month or so here and talking about how if we're going to get out of debt, we need to work on it together. Um, I sent him different shows that you've um, released and in order for him to listen to it, he's just not on board with it. Um, Why? I had, I'm sorry. Why does he not want to combine your finances? Um, he says that he's got a plan in place that works for him and um, he's and it does not include anything. you. Yeah. So how long has he been having an affair? Yeah. <laughs> um, our finances basically have been always separated. That wasn't what um, I asked. Since I, I don't know of any particular situation where he is having an affair. Are you safe? Um. Yeah. In in my home, I'm I'm okay. I just can't speak loudly. Okay. You can't what? Can't speak loudly. Um, so y- you just called two guys listening to how you are having to speak in your own home out of fear of a man who calls himself your husband. And I need you to hear from me, who's also a husband, sitting next to another guy who's a husband. That safety can come in the form of physical safety, and it can also come in the form of psychological safety where you don't feel welcome in your own house. And Dave's question about, is he having an affair? I need you to hear hear the behavior, hear what your husband's trying to tell you through his behavior. That is, you are not a priority. His priorities are somewhere else, and he is disinterested in a relationship with you. Correct. Right? And it's heartbreaking, and I'm saying it real direct, and I know that's hard, um, but you are not safe at all. You know that, right? I'm not telling you anything you don't know. You know that, right? Yes, I know that, and this is part of the last four months has been very revealing. There you go. And so Dave's question about an affair, that'd be, that would be, be my first question, too. Something has changed in this marriage. It was already separate, and we already would have poked at you for having different accounts. Something else has changed. Either he's about to leave, or he already has left, or something has shifted, or he's in trouble, he's got an addiction issue. Um, something else has shifted. He's in love with something else. Right. Um, <laughs> the phone. Um, politics. Um, there's a lot of different things that are distracting him, but we are all in the same house together we, ever since COVID, including the kids. Mm-hmm. How many um, children do you have? Two girls. And what is your income? Well, right now it's not where it could be. Um, it's about 40000 What could it be? If I went back to my former career that I left to try to do this RV life with him, um, I could be making upwards of 90 on my own. So Maybe what? 
She could be making upwards of 90 on her own. Oh, 90. Yeah. I didn't hear yeah. the 90. Okay, I'm sorry. And um, how old are your children? 13 and 9. Okay. Can I ask you a real hard question? Yes. Is this the picture of love that you want to communicate to them? No, it's not. And that's, I mean, I've been, you know, wrestling with this, like I said, for the last four months. And after speaking to some of my friends and coming to the realization that, you know, not only is it financial abuse, it's my mental health, it's my children's mental yep, health. There you it's, go. Yep. It's all of it. It's, this is not the person my parents raised. Um, my dad, I was completely, I bought this house on my own, single, um, I was completely debt-free when I got married, yeah. and that has changed. Okay, And kiddo. I want to get I, back to who I was before. There you yeah. go. So here's what you're going to have to do. Um, your friends aren't who walk through you with this except as friends, but you need to get a good counselor. Yes, so you need to go see a marriage counselor starting today that is a strong person that will try to help you save your marriage if it's salvageable. That will give you some uh, verbiage and some positions to remind you you're not crazy because you got two guys who are saying you're not crazy. You're not. Okay. And we're both, we both know this stuff. Okay. So um, you need to get a counselor that can guide you through this. You don't want to do this off of a radio call and you don't want to do this off of your friend's opinion over a glass of wine. You need to get a counselor in your corner that can give you some ways to explain to your husband that what will amount to ultimately an ultimatum a boundary a boundary that says you are going to re-engage or you're going to disengage right. we're not going to play here in the middle and i'm not going to be abused at this level anymore and you got to have someone help you set that boundary not two guys on the radio but you're not crazy and you need to do this and you need to do this right now serving Christian Health Cost Sharing Ministry, CHM has shared medical expenses for its members since 1981. We believe you should have the freedom to focus on your health while being supported by a community of believers, giving you the opportunity to create many more firsts. out about your retirement savings these days well should you be concerned are you worried about the stock market dropping you need someone in your corner to help you with this stuff well i think you do i have people in my corner we recommend a smart vester pro if you're a smart investor you have a smart vester pro in your corner these are investing professionals that don't work for me but they have been vetted by our team very carefully they will have the heart of a teacher and they will recommend information and investments just like you would hear me do here on the air and like I do personally as well. To learn more about that, go to RamseySolutions.com slash SmartVestor. Remember, when the stock market goes down, if it's going to come back up someday, then it's on sale. Always remember that. That's just an easy way to keep in mind, should I cash out, should I freak out. John, we got to go back to that last caller for a second uh, because there's a whole lot of that in America today. Yeah. Okay. There's a lot of different ways that husbands and wives interact over money. There's a situation where they work together and everything's combined 
and they make decisions together. And when they make decisions on their spending and their investing, they realize that they are truly adding a level of unity, a level of oneness to their relationship, a level of communication to their relationship. And that's plan A. And it has the highest probability of increasing the quality of your marriage and, and the highest probability of you becoming wealthy. Plan A does. Plan B is to healthy, mentally mature, emotionally mature people who uh, operate financially like roommates. Mm -hmm. But both of them have a vote, and there is a mutual respect, and there's communication between them, but they run separate accounts. That's a plan B. There's a, that lowers the probability of wealth building and the quality of the marriage substantially, but it still functions. Mm -hmm. uh, plan C that's even worse is uh, mom or dad, husband or wife, one of the two, is in charge. Mm -hmm. And the other one is doled out money as an allowance. Well, I got to check with mama, see if I got any money, mm -hmm. uh, meaning the wife is in charge of the money. Or I got to ask my husband because he handles all the money. And uh, or, you know, we don't I don't know if we, I don't know what we've got. And they die. And the one that handles the money dies. And the other one just left clueless and with no skills because yeah. they don't have decades of handling anything. They basically are a glorified child yep. being taken care of by an unglorified parent yeah. uh, in that setting. And that is damaging to the relationship and is really Damaging the money, yeah. really damaging the money. Th that uh, Plan F, where you fail the test, is one toxic member of the team is in control of the money and the other person. It's fine. That's abuse. With right. toxic financial abuse. Right. The extreme of that is there's a high correlation in the data and in the actual practice, and I've seen it on the financial side. I've talked with other coaches. You and I have talked about this. Uh, you probably can cite a study. I've just talked to other people that have seen it in practice that if a, if a husband has extreme control over the finances to the point that the wife is not allowed to make any, can't go to the grocery store by herself, can't pay any electric bill, she's given $2 at a time, not $2,000 at a time, uh, extreme control Probably 90 to 95 percent of the time he's hitting her. Hmm. It's domestic violence yeah. tied to that. If there's that level of control, you can just about count on it. That last one gets really close to that. That's why my first question was, are you safe, right? Because yeah, you could but feel she, it. She wanted to say safe was emotional abuse, but she's upstairs and can't speak <laughs> yeah. loudly because he's downstairs. That's right. Which makes me wonder about that whole thing. And how many calls have we taken, you and I have taken, that have a couple on, they disagree, they're either laughing about it, or they're in jest but serious. That's the first one of these where somebody's hiding upstairs saying, uh, help. It, it, it's, uh, not, yeah, it's not the first one, sadly, but it won't, it won't be the last one. But the, the point of us bringing this up is, um, I mean, to outline what A plan is, B plan is, C plan is, and F plan is... Um, Here's the thing. Every one of those, regardless of who you are and which player you are in that role, is a choice to go forward that way. Right. And I would encourage every one of you to choose to move towards the A plan. Yeah. Um, or if you are unsafe, to choose to get out. Yeah. Uh, whether you're unsafe emotionally or you're unsafe physically. I don't, I don't tell people to file divorce. And I don't tell people to file bankruptcy. But there are situations where... You're unsafe. You need to get out of there. And if you find yourself, she mentioned something at the end of that call that just buried itself in my heart a little bit. She said, this isn't who I am. I, I've looked up. I bought this house. I bought it on my own. I had a great career. I was debt free. And now I'm somebody else. That's common a language of somebody who's in an abusive relationship. I have become somebody else. In order to keep, keep myself safe, keep my kids safe, keep this guy from you you know, keep his rage, me. keep his rage down. That's right, that's right. And when you look in the mirror and say, "Who are you? Who have you become?" Because there's a rage person in your life. That is signal number one. Call somebody and get some help right away. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. That's um, the, the the wrathful man. Proverbs talks about <sighs> is a dangerous character. Golly, man. It's a dangerous character, and um. Uh, and the sad thing is, is that he's probably has very low coping skills himself and that's what drives him to rage. That's right. Yeah. And he's get some, I'd love for him to get some help as well. And she mentioned something, the number of calls I'm taking Dave on my show, the number, the data is bearing it out. The folks over the last COVID. 24 months COVID. who have gotten 
psychotic about their cell phones and new data and new information and news. Uh, it's destroying people. Put your phones down and say, I got a problem, and go re engage. Or call. You, you get a human being. Get a counselor. Yes. You do not need your. Put your turn your stupid screen off. And get around human beings. I mean, it's uh, screen time. Uh, people have gone down the, the conspiracy theory or alternate theory or whatever you want to call it, uh, rabbit hole, and they live there. They live. They've moved in. Yeah. Yeah. And so I've had to put up a boundary in my life. I've got a certain number of acquaintances slash friends that I'm like, not here. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not talking about COVID anymore. I'm tired of it. There you go. It's not. It's no longer fun. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Yeah. Because you're all stupid. All of you are stupid. <laughs> I'm just not talking about it anymore. You know. And uh, if I die from it, y'all can just t- y'all can make fun of me then. It's right, fine. Right. It's, but it's all good. And you can be mad at Dave Ramsey, and you're already mad at him. So screw it. You know. Right. Whatever. It's okay. So, um, but I mean, this whole thing you've got to this rage that has welled up inside of the started with a quarantine, Man. and has driven people uh, the fear off of that. It's an existential crisis of another kind. It is, and we are feeling a mass psychosis man we've got dude and this is how nonsense gets started dave that you can't wheel back and so i want people to put their phones down and go call a friend call and ask your close buddies have i been raged out and if they're good friends they'll be honest with you say now or they'll look you out and say yeah we've been worried about you yeah i've had those moments in my life man well you get in fight mode and you stay jacked up and you never get off you just go looking for the next fight the next fight the next fight yeah yeah and it's a jacked up thing and then all you do is just keep fox news on or cnn on whichever version you are and they'll feed it to you and they'll make sure you're pissed off all 24 7 that's how they get paid exactly and uh and if not you can turn on your local news and a tornado's gonna kill you (laughs) but yeah oh my god there's a snowstorm (laughs) it's like oh jeez just get in the truck and drive to work. <laughs> or don't. But pick one. Don't be ain't go be Or don't. But don't, don't be, be d- turn maniacal the t- about it. Turn the TV off. Turn it's, it off. It's, it's white powder. It's gonna be okay. <sighs> It'll be all right. And so, um Yeah, and, and it, but the, the wussification of America, this idea that we don't know how to fight through something, and then when we get into this we don't have the, the we don't have the character structure to fight like a man. Instead, we fight like a boy. Hmm. And Through stay, power and control, stay in a jacked up, jacked angry. up bully mode, uh, instead of manly, righteous anger at something that's truly principled and wrong. Hmm. And so you become an activist. God help you, because you don't have anything else to do. Hmm. You know, it's just it's weird. Yeah. It's weird. It's happening out there. And so if you're in those situations, folks, get get some help. Call somebody. Please call, call somebody. Call somebody. Get somebody in your corner. Walk you walk you out of it. And put the phone down. This is the Ramsey Show. If you're not using Pure Talk for your wireless, you're paying too much. Pure Talk gives you the same great 5G coverage on the same 5G network as one of the big guys for half the cost. The average family saves over $800 a year. Go to puretalk.com and choose the affordable plan that's right for you. With their 30-day risk-free guarantee, you have nothing to lose. Go to puretalk.com and enter the promo code RAMSEY to save 50% off your first month. personality open phones at 888-825-5225 tj is with us in lexington kentucky hi tj how are you i'm good thank you dave and john for taking my call and i appreciate your ministry and example to me and my family and many others that uh uh read your books and take your classes so thank you well thank you sir you're very kind how can we help today 
So my question is, my wife and I, we're both completely debt-free. We're on baby step seven. Good. And we've got some cash that we're looking to put into some real estate Mm -hmm. um, and to uh, rent out, uh, do some rentals. Mm -hmm. Um, How many rentals do you have? I've had one in the past. We currently don't have any. What's your Um, net worth now? About two million. Good for you. Well done, TJ. Excellent job. So now you're thinking about buying some rental property. Okay. Yep, we're looking to possibly get back into it once your guidance and thoughts on it. But uh, it's also twofold. My daughter um, is looking to. Uh, she's starting out her career, and we're looking to potentially buy a condominium and rent it out to her and another roommate. Um, in in the meantime, mm-hmm. and wanted to get your thoughts on that. Okay. Um, I would decide which it is. Is it your daughter or is it a rental property? But I wouldn't combine the two. Um, my daughter came out of college and I was in, right in the middle of buying a bunch of property. And uh, one of the properties I bought was a really nice condominium like you're describing. And uh, she moved into it. And uh, as a gift, we let her live there and we charged her roommates money. They were my tenants. And uh, then when she got married later, uh, she and her husband went on and did their own thing. Uh, But that was just a way I could bless her with having no rent. But I'm not going to get in a thing where this kid who's starting off her life is writing a check to her millionaire daddy. Okay. I wouldn't do it. I think it changes the relationship. It's hard to be landlord and tenant and father and daughter. Do you That's see th- why I appreciate your input and advice. Do you see the difference between if she didn't want to get a job and she just came home? Sometimes I'll tell people if they're going to move back home, they're going to pay rent in that room. One is you are trying to incentivize um, them to go out on their own. The other is you've got somebody who's you, you've you're able to bless your kid in this way as they're launching off. Do you see the difference there? How much is the condo you're thinking about buying? It's around 300000 Okay. How many kids you got? Have three. Okay. All right. Well, at some point, you could say, um, I'm going to buy you a condo and give it to you uh, if you wanted to. Uh, but on the con- if it were me, it would be like on the condition that you're living life well and uh, that this is a blessing to you and on the condition that you promise me you'll never borrow money. And uh, then they can use that money that they would have paid in a house payment to become wealthy with. Quick. Really quick. And uh, you've changed yeah. your family. That way you've changed your family tree. I'm not sure you want to do that to the tune of 900 out of 2 million today. But at some point you'll be able to do that. And the first step could be buying a condo for cash that you keep and she lives there free. And then later on you might decide to do some of that other stuff. But um, I don't loan family members money. And um, I don't loan anybody money because it changes the relationship. The borrower is slave to the lender. I'll either give it to you or I won't. And I may give it to you with a few strings attached that I'll give it to you, but you've got to go through Financial Peace University and get your crap together. You know, you got to get on a budget. And, uh, you know, you're going to have to be, you know, come in, meet with one of our coaches and have them coach you up on getting your budget and getting, your, getting yourself on a debt snowball and cutting up your credit cards and if you do that, we'll give you this X number of dollars and get some things started. I had a friend of mine from college that ended up homeless, and we we're trying to help him get off the street, and that's what we did. We got, bought him a car, put him up in a hotel, but it was on the condition that you know he, he comes in and does some work mm-hmm. and comes in and does some um, coaching, counseling, so that we fix the problem. Right. You know that kind of a thing. But I don't. I didn't. I didn't loan it to him. Right. And I don't lo- didn't I don't loan people money anybody, but certainly not my own kids. And I'm not going to charge them rent either. So that that's the reason I don't want to change. Thanksgiving dinner just tastes weird when you eat with your landlord. It's just weird, and it cer- certainly changed if if you owe them money, it changes everything. So um, you've got the right heart and you've got the right mind. You're trying to not be an enabler mm-hmm. and allow her to be lazy, but I think that's already settled. I don't think she's lazy. Right. 
You never mentioned a thing about her being off kilter, and if she was off kilter, you would have said so. And if she works for six months and decides she's just working so hard, I just don't want to – I'm tired. They're rude, and she's going to stay at home for six months. Then we may talk about, okay, if you're going to live in my house, then – Working is part of the equation. Working is part of your free rent yeah. here. Yeah. yeah, you get to work. You have to. You have to. You know, I'm not. I'm not setting up a thing where your trust fund baby sitting on the back of a yacht, right? Um, eating whatever or Spend whatever you money, do on yeah. the back of a yacht. But um, but the uh, bond bonds. That's it. Lady in the in the audience just said it. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. But yeah, I'm not, I don't even know what you did. But see, she knows. But yeah, but the uh, uh, yeah, that that's it. And I'm I'm lip reading today too. That's not bad. I don't know that I've ever had a bonbon. I think I'm going to make it a priority to try them out as show. You know research. what? You could switch out bonbons for gummy bears. As, <laughs> I don't think that gummy bears for bonbons. You could Oof. be John has a bonbon problem. That would be interesting. <laughs> Kelly's like, please don't Kelly's have that. Like, no. Please don't have that problem. No. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's so go to who, who's, who's next. Let's who's go to Bryce. Next? Let's break this up. <laughs> Bryce is in St. George, Utah. Hey, Bryce, what's up? Gents, I appreciate the time. I'm looking for uh, your opinion on whether I'm stupid or not, and I'll, I'll take it constructively. <laughs> yes, um, we're good I, at this. <laughs> good. Um, I recently uh, moved – of my employment, I was full time making around 180. I moved it to part time, so I make around 90 now, so that my wife could pursue this dream of starting a business. Basically, she's a CPA, so she started a CPA firm and an online course. Um, she makes around 300 part time. She's done extremely well. I couldn't be more proud of her. Wow. Um, but I'm I'm kind of holding her back by still working. 20 hours a week and I love my job. I love my career. I'm an actuarial consultant. I, I like building Why relationships. Are you I like talking back? to people. Sorry, go ahead. How are you holding her back? Well, it, if I quit my career and it really completely took over the kids and the house and all that, she could make another 300 plus. She's only working 30 hours, 40 hours a week right now. And yeah, but you love what you do. She could be doing more. Yeah, you make I half do, a million dollars. But, Hire but some numerically, help, Numerically, it's stupid. But. Hire a nanny. <laughs> Hire some help, man. Right. I, it's not stupid. Hire a nanny. I, I, you, get, you, get, you get satisfaction out of your work. She gets satisfaction out of her work. Um, we're not abandoning the children. We're not sending them to boarding school. Uh, we're going to still be there and love them. Both of you are working part time already. You said she's working part time making three hundred. You're working part time making ninety. And so, you know, if she wants to gear up a little bit, you want to gear up a little bit. That's fine. And uh, you know, you're not going to. I don't. I'm, we're not suggesting you work eighty hours a week. But if you go from twenty hours to thirty hours a week, and you go from three ninety to whatever, hire a nanny. It's not that big a deal. Is there a level of, Bryce, just shut up and be grateful for what you have? Like, we don't need more. We're very frugal. We're natural savers. It's, it, it just feels dumb. No, it doesn't. Leaving potential on the it's table. Not, it's, not, it's not a matter of being greedy or ambitious. Your wife enjoys what she's doing, and she's enjoying the success of growing this thing. And she wants to do more of that. Yep. And I often hear it on the other side you. when my wife has a or my husband's got a hobby and he's not making any money at it. Um, and as long as it's not detracting from the family, then it, it's the same thing. Except this one just earns three yeah. to six hundred thousand dollars, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, it, you feed ambition to the point that it's not workaholism, and to the point that you're blessing others and your family is not out of kilter. Right. Your family's not off bubble. This is about joy. This is just about finding a little bit better balance and hard for people that are doing this to actually pay someone else to come in and help yeah it's a hard thing to do it's a good thing to do yeah.
25, 21 is our scripture of the day. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. Benjamin Franklin says, love your enemies, for they tell you your faults. <laughs> hey, I love that. <laughs> Welcome to Twitter. <laughs> Who said that? Benjamin Franklin. I've never heard that quote. Love your enemies, for they tell you your faults. <laughs> There's a lot of love out there for you, Dave. Oh. A lot of love. <laughs> <laughs> Janelle is in Tacoma, Washington. Hi, Janelle. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hello, Mr. Ramsey. Hi, what's up? Um, uh, well, I have a question, but I just wanted to say thank you so much. Um, my husband and I have been doing a poem since March of 2020, and so far we've paid off almost $60,000. Way to go! Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah, we should be all out of debt by the end of this year. Good for you. Well done. <laughs> Proud of you. Um, so, uh, my question is, my husband's car, it died over the weekend. And he has a weird car where I feel like the engine was put in upside down. Because the starter is in a weird place and the alternator, you have to like pull the engine out in order to fix it. So we're looking at probably an eight hundred to a two thousand dollar repair for his uh, Mazda, and it's it's older. It's got a hundred and fifty thousand miles on it. Um, and we're wondering at what point do we say go ahead and fix it? At what point would you be like, I'll just try and sell it as is and uh how much money do you have in savings um we have the thousand dollar emergency fund and um as the month goes on we kind of put aside all the stuff uh for the end of the month for us to pay onto our debt so we can take all of what we were going to pay on our debt. How much is that? Plus the thousand dollar emergency fund. How much is that? Uh, so that should be about thirty five hundred dollars. So you got forty five hundred dollars, and you have an eight hundred dollar repair. What's the car worth if it were fixed? If it's fixed and we're going to sell it just personal or uh, private sale, it's probably we could probably get about six grand for it. Six thousand dollars. Mm-hmm. And if you don't fix it, you can get one thousand dollars for it. Yeah, maybe one thousand five is for like. Yeah. If so you spend eight hundred dollars on it, even if you're going to sell it. Yes. Because otherwise, you get a cut of five thousand dollars instead of a cut of eight hundred dollars. You go from six thousand yeah, value to one thousand dollars in value if you don't fix it. Even if you're going to sell it, you fix it, and you sell it for yeah. six thousand. Mm-hmm. If it's not the starter, though, then it could be like a two thousand dollar fix because we have to lift the. You're still selling it for six thousand. Yeah. So okay. you're gonna you're gonna fix the car and you're gonna get more than one opinion because so far what we have is a bunch of freaking theories. We're gonna actually yeah. analyze what's wrong with this car and be dealing with facts, not theories. Right now you're yeah. dealing with a worry and a problem. You don't have the facts to solve the problem. The facts are two facts different yet. people have actually looked at this that know how to fix it and have given you two separate bids that will fix it, and they have diagnosed the exact problem. Okay. And if that's $962, you're going to spend it to fix it, and then you can decide if you want to keep it or not. But here's the All thing. Right. You can sell it for $6,000 and buy another $6,000 car, and stay right on your plan mm-hmm. minus the 800 that you had to come up with. The $800 is your car repair that's used up your emergency fund. So you got to turn around and put the $1,000 back in the emergency fund because you spent on this car. But that, other than that, yeah. you're going fi- you, to fix the car. You're going to fix the car. Would you recommend? Okay, yes. I think you're I tired of it. I think you're sick of fixing a car that's, uh, that's, this is the third time you've dealt with it being upside down and all uh, and the engine's upside down and all that. And so it sounds <laughs> like you're tired of the car. I'm a little bit tired of the car, but my husband is not, and it's his car. Like, it's he's well, the question is, financially, is the car good for our family? If the car's okay to keep driving for a while after we fix it, then keep it and drive it. I don't care if you keep it or not. Okay. But I think you're going to spend an eight $800 on a $6,000 car. Now, let's change the equation for a second for example purposes, so you kind of know how I made this decision. All right? Okay. Let's say that the car was a true hoopty, and it was worth $2,000. But you can mm-hmm. sell it for twelve hundred dollars salvage. Well, I'd sell it for salvage because okay. I don't put eight hundred dollars in a two thousand dollar car because the difference in the salvage I, is a break even. 
But the difference in this okay. one is $5,000 drop in value due to an $800 repair. But you don't okay. put in the car, if you put more into the car than it raises it in value, then you don't do it. Okay. In this case, it's going to raise right. it in Thank value you. a lot more by fixing it, even if you're going to sell it. And that, that tells you how to work this out in the future. But some of you are out there driving $2,000 hoopties right now, and you're in the middle of your baby step two. And those are those are throwaway cars. They're garage sale cars. You buy them at a garage sale. And when they break down, you sell them for salvage, and you throw them away, and you get you another garage sale car. And you keep going. I've done that. I've driven those cars. I have to. They're no fun. They're a car you give a name to, take a picture of, to tell your grandchildren, this is what it's like back in the days of all 22 when we was getting out of debt, kiddo. And just back before we had no money, before I had $10 million. The names I had for some of those cars in my life, I don't think I could tell my kids. Well, they were I, not nice names. I had one that was the predominant color on it was Bondo. We, we called it the Bondo Buggy. That was its name. Old Blue the Bondo Buggy. And the vinyl roof was torn loose across the front, so when you drove it, it filled up with air like a parachute. Yeah. So I'm classing it down the road with this parachute on top of this Bondo Buggy. And, um, yeah. That's we, how you know she stop loves at, you, Stop at a stoplight, the top would settle. Pew. Come back down, then you take off again and go back up. It That's was, how uh, you know. If you ever wondered, does Sharon really love me? Yep. Uh, Sharon would have left, but she didn't have a car. I was the only one who had a car. So, yeah. Oh, uh, that was it, man. Whew. That was fun. Not really. Uh, man. So, uh, the Bondo buggy. Yeah. Well, I mean, you gotta have, you gotta name it. And we had a, we had a, uh, George and I were pulling him up in here the other day cause we were looking for a car. I'm trying to get George to buy a car cause yeah. he's paid off his house. It's time for him to buy a car. It's ridiculous. <laughs> he's driving that hoopty of a Honda out there. And so he's cheap. George is cheap. I he's, am too. He spent more. He spent more on his French bulldog. He's, on his he's other level. That's right. His he's his little different. designer serious. dog he bought. His little designer dog with big ears. But yeah, it's a cute dog. <laughs> but the uh, um, but yeah the uh, uh, I was, you know I remember I bought Sharon a Pinto that was um, a nineteen I think it was a seventy two and it was uh, like um, kind of forest green. Yeah. Really seriously ugly. This car. I mean, it was the it was the old version of a Ford Fiesta. Yeah, it was an absolute piece of crap. <laughs> I mean, when the gearbox in that thing, when you change the gears, it was like changing gears in your riding lawnmower. You know how they feel? Oh yeah, like, yeah. Chi -chi -chi -chi. You know, it's like you change gears, you'd feel every movement of the stupid thing. It was, and and I swear the clutch was like a riding lawnmower clutch. The engine was less powerful than my riding lawnmower. I had an '88 Tercel EZ hatchback when I drove it. My knees were up here around my shoulders because it was so little oh yeah i sold it for a hundred bucks hatchback the hatchback yeah, yeah you could you could haul you could haul a deer bucks. you could haul a deer in oh, i could put my get my guitar amps back there i sold it for 300 bucks and some college kids eventually took it out into a field and drove it till it stopped that's that's where that car died i got a call about three years later from a they drove it in the field and, and they buried they it they thought it'd the be axle. hilarious just the, to the axle they're just gonna drive it into the woods until it just quits running and that was their fun for the night that's how beat up this car was and then i got a call about three years later from a storage saying i owe them a whole bunch of money i guess somebody towed it out of their field years later but that was my Tercel, and I'm going to find one for – that's going to be my son's first car. So you didn't transfer the title? You left it oh, in your no, name? Oh, no, no. I sold it to him. Yeah, well, then yeah. how, did it, how did you get charged oh, for the no, storage? Oh, no, no, no. Well, because I sold it to my brother. I didn't want to throw him out on the radio, oh, but there well, you go. Uh, well, He's the one who did it. He needs to pay for the storage. Well, they said you can either uh, give us the car or – pay us however two or three thousand bucks and i said merry christmas you are the new owners of <laughs> just got you a car of an old <laughs> you just got hatchback. you a car buddy <laughs> call your friends <laughs> you can't make this stuff up uh and you won't hear this on any other radio show i'll just tell you <laughs> this is big time entertainment you right should here buy a pinto i'm gonna buy it yourself we're gonna race that'll be Get my lawnmower out. That'll put this hour in the books. We'll be back with you before you know it. In the meantime, remember, there's ultimately only one way to financial peace, and that's to walk daily with the Prince of Peace, Christ Jesus. This is James Childs, producer of The Ramsey Show. Did you know The Ramsey Show is one of the most popular podcasts in the world? Subscribe or follow today wherever you listen to podcasts.